Okay, so we're going to wrap up, finish up Unit 3 today. So we um, ended with George Washington's presidency and all those things that George Washington gives us first. George Washington, being the first, is the one who sets the precedent. He is the one who is remembered above all others because, again, he did it first, kind of like Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. So, without further ado... Washington has a cabinet. He, um, he sets precedents again, like being called Mr. President, like only serving two terms. And he says, I need help in this executive branch. I'm not going to be here by myself. So he appoints a cabinet. These are executive officers who help him to administer his government. Now, these, these offices that you see here are still in play today. Every president has had one of each of these and still does to this day. Today, they are all the heads of very large governmental departments that, that, that will have hundreds or even thousands of employees under them. Our first, and what you need to know about each, is the title of the office, the cabinet position, who holds that position, and what that position does. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson handles foreign affairs and official government documents. Thomas Jefferson has experience. He has been ambassador to France on behalf of the United States, so he is well suited for this job. Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton manages the government's finances. Now, I'm not sure exactly what finance he has done except that he was uh, orphaned at a young age and he's quite well off now and uh, he has definite ideas. So I'm not sure exactly the experience, but this guy's got ideas and uh, he's a very important founder as well. Secretary of War, Henry Knox. Today we call the Secretary of War position Secretary of Defense, but Henry Knox was um, uh, an officer who was in charge of artillery for Washington during the Revolutionary War. Again, very trusted. All three of these men, highly qualified, highly trusted. He is uh, in charge of the military, Knox is, and manages foreign affairs. The fourth and kind of unofficial uh, at that time cabinet member is the Attorney General Edmund Randolph. Uh, Edmund Randolph serves as chief lawyer for the national government. Now, again, all these positions are in play today. And uh, in particular, your Secretary of State position has given us several presidents. Several future presidents served originally as Secretary of State. So that's a very, very prominent role to have. The Whiskey Rebellion. Whiskey Rebellion. Now, as you recall, we had a situation with Daniel Shays and his men revolting. I kind of felt like Daniel Shays had a point. They're getting their farms taken from them by kind of pernicious laws. Well, here we have a uprising in 1794 by a group of Pennsylvania farmers who are protesting a new tax on whiskey, and whiskey is one of their income sources. I don't really think they had a point. The government is allowed to tax. That is part of the Constitution, and they felt this was a, a place to tax, and I don't think the tax was too... Uh, biting or too painful for them. I think they just didn't want to pay it. So they said, we're going to rebel like Daniel Shays did. Well, the difference is now we have an executive branch and that executive branch is in charge of enforcing that tax. And George Washington is the chief executive and George Washington is a general. George Washington said, get my horse, Martha. I'm going to go kick somebody's hind end. So George Washington shows up at the front of the army and these guys, well, let's just say the rebellion was short lived and it's a completely different outcome. Instead of the, instead of the rebellion getting violent and, and getting uh, pretty extreme as Shays did and getting to the point that people in Boston were fearing for their lives and uh, the people who went out to stop these uh, Shays were volunteers. Here you have a, a, an actual response by the government by the president, and it is very decisive. So another thing about Washington is uh, he has to do with Britain and France. Well, following 
our revolution by a few years. Uh, by the time we've written the Constitution, France has had a revolution. They have deposed their king, beheaded the king and queen. Many, many nobles have been beheaded and thrown into jails, and nobody's sure exactly who's in charge of France. And the nobles of France said, hey, George, uh, you remember when we helped you out? We need you to pick a side. And uh, the Neutrality Proclamation of 1793 is George Washington saying, America will not get involved in your issues, uh, which is really refreshing if you consider the way we handle things today. George Washington says, you deal with your own problems. The United States will not choose a side in the French Revolution. Um, this is because we cannot. We are not capable of choosing a side. We're too weak. Great Britain has been capturing United States ships as well. This is the merchants who are asking this to happen. John Jay is uh, dispatched to London. John Jay is one of your writers of the Federalist Papers. And Jay's Treaty uh, is named after him because he arranged it. Jay's Treaty, Britain pays for damage to the ships that were captured by their Navy. And they agreed to give up forts out west. They were supposed to give up the forts out west when we won the war, but they are still there. They said, okay, we'll go ahead and leave those forts that we were supposed to already have left. In return, the United States pays their debts to the British merchants. It does not protect Americans' rights when we are sailing on the oceans. So we're still kind of fair game. So kind of talking about the way we're dealing with these two superpowers is that Washington took the position of neutrality with dealing with both, realizing that our new nation could easily be destroyed if we chose sides. This precedent will be followed for many years after Washington left office. We're going to keep doing that for a very, very long time. Fare thee well. Um, George Washington gives a farewell speech. This was not anything that is told to do in the Constitution. This is something he took upon himself, and he wrote a lengthy letter to America, to his children, if you want to call George Washington the father of his country, he writes this lengthy letter, sends it off to the prominent newspapers of the time to publish, and they do. Today, we follow the precedent, or we are supposed to follow the precedent, that when a president is leaving office, he will address the nation on TV, and they will talk about this as uh, President George W. Bush's farewell address, President Barack Obama's uh, farewell address, and, and it's a big deal. And generally, as the president's leaving office, he's going to look back on his time in office, and then he's going to look towards the future. Well, George Washington, again, he sets the precedent here, and he sets the tone by giving us two warnings, two very, very important warnings. Because of dealing with uh, France and England, as he has, and knowing kind of what's out there and what's to be expected, he says, do not form long-term alliances with foreign countries because his fear is if we choose a side, then whenever that country goes to war, we have to go and fight with them. We are tied to them. He says, do not do this. He next says, avoid political parties. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton have disagreements while they are in office. We have explored that with our lessons and, and different things we've done. But these disagreements are going to result in the political parties in America. And Washington is just totally bummed about this. He's not happy at all. George Washington does not belong to a political party. He's the only president who does not. Political parties form during his administration. And this is why, to the right, you don't have to write this down, but this is why George Washington does not like the thought of political parties. He has seen them in England, and he says this. Political parties are likely to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and usurp for themselves the reins of government. In other words, cunning and ambitious and unprincipled men will take over the country and use it through the political parties and use it for their own devices. And I think he is very prophetic there. So here are those political parties. The Federalist Party for Alexander Hamilton they favored wealth by the ruling by rule by the wealthy class, sorry. A strong federal government, an emphasis on manufacturing, a loose interpretation of the Constitution. We'll continue to talk about that later. 
British Alliances and National Bank and Protective Tariffs. A tariff is a tax that's meant to protect your industry. So protective tariff protects industry in America. Democratic Republicans leader is Thomas Jefferson. He favors rule by the people, a strong state government, and emphasis on agriculture, strict interpretation of the Constitution. Again, we'll talk about the differences later. He, of course, is the French ambassador. He favors an alliance with the French. He doesn't want a national bank, rather than state banks, because he wants state to have the power. And he wants free trade. As in, if, a, if another country is doing it cheaper and they put you out of business, then so be it. It's up to you to not let that happen. So they are exactly opposites. So we have an election, an actual contested election following George Washington stepping down. And there's your winner, this handsome fellow from Massachusetts, Johnny Adams. John Adams has appeared already. He is a cousin of Sam Adams, the leader of the Sons of Liberty. He has served as lawyer uh, to remove to, to for the British troops who fired during the Boston massacre. He is a very smart man. He is involved in the Constitution, and uh, he, he's a signer of that as well, a framer. So he, too, is a framer. He is a Federalist, and the second highest vote-getter is Thomas Jefferson. The Constitution did not have a way to decide the vice president at that time. So the winner of the election is president, and second place is vice president. But if you remember, Thomas Jefferson is a Democratic Republican, the opposite of John Adams. There's the uh, couple things that happened during the administration. The XYZ affair is a bribery scandal with France. French officials who are going to be referred to as Monsieur X, Y, and Z demand money from us to help negotiate a peace treaty because we have an undeclared war going on with France on the high seas. That's a that's just a scandal is, is what that is. The Federalists next pass the Alien and Sedition Acts because people are criticizing the government. The Alien Act limits the rights of immigrants. Those are the aliens. The Sedition Act makes it illegal to disagree with the government in public. These are not things that go along with the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the idea of America. This is exactly the opposite of that. Why are they doing that, you ask? To try to control and stay in power. And you will find that one thing, starting right here, that all political parties have done ever since then is try to figure out a way to maintain their power. And Thomas Jefferson is his vice president, as we mentioned. And Thomas Jefferson is working against him at every step. And he is exactly doing the opposite of whatever Adams wants him to do and uh, publicly undermining John Adams. So John Adams has a very unhappy single term as president. In response to the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, Jefferson on the right and James Madison on the left secretly penned two resolutions. They didn't sign them as you didn't sign the Federalist Papers, so they're taking a page out of the Federalist book. And they assert the right that states have to nullify any law they believe is unconstitutional. Because remember, these guys want the power with the states. So the Federalists re retorted by saying the people, not the states, create the Constitution, and that the Supreme Court and not the states determine the constitutionality of the laws. No other states besides Virginia or Kentucky adopt those resolutions. Uh, we now have 15 total states with Virginia and Kentucky coming in at this time. The southern states are going to use this argument to try to nullify any laws they don't like in the 1800s. So they, they kind of do this with a really good purpose, but it ends up coming back years later as the southern states try to use this to prolong slavery. So uh, that's kind of what goes on. The, the southern states say, hey, if we don't agree with your law, we're not going to have to abide by it because that's what Jefferson and Madison said. So they kind of created a monster with these two resolutions. 